Welcome everyone to SQL Friday. This is SQL Friday number seven and our star of today is Ben Weisman who is going to present data analysis using GitHub, Azure Data Studio and Big Data Clusters. Uh, regarding big, big Data Clusters, I think Ben is probably the person you should talk to if you want to know more about it. He has a plural site course on the topic and uh, yeah, if, if you want help with big data clusters, call Ben. He knows a bit or two about it. Ben, welcome. Thank you. Stage so, is yours. Uh, you. Just one more thing though. I think yeah. everyone is muted and you know the drill. If you have questions, just post them in the chat and I will interrupt Ben with them. Okay. Right. And um, please do feel free to interrupt me anytime. So um, whenever there's any questions, um, just say the word. I would. think that's it. Um, since you already did the honors of introducing me, I guess we can skip that part. So let's jump right into um, all the stuff that we actually need to look at before we can start talking about um, what we're going to be talking about today. Because we need to cover the grounds on Spark, Kubernetes, Hadoop, Docker, Python, SQL, and Linux. So, um, surprise, this is not a lunch session, but this will go straight until Monday, Monday <laughs> evening, that well, is. Unless there's questions, then we will go into overtime. Yeah, now, it works for me. I'm on vacation anyway. So. Excellent. <laughs> and who does not love a little bit of SQL and Linux on their vacation? I mean, seriously. <laughs> so, um, in all seriousness, though, these are. These technologies built the foundation of big data clusters, and some of them are more or less important depending on what your role is. But there's a couple of very important bits and pieces in there, like Kubernetes, Docker, and SQL and Linux, that I think everybody from the traditional SQL world should get acquainted with, because this is where everything is kind of moving. So if you're in a DBA kind of role, and so far, all you're doing is SQL on Windows. You should start playing and get acquainted with SQL and Linux. And SQL and Linux runs in containers, um, well, not exclusively, but in many cases. So get acquainted with Docker and get acquainted with Kubernetes, because this is, from my personal um, opinion, this is the future of deployment. I don't think we're going to have like setup.exe um, for the indefinite future. I'm sure there's going to be another release or two or maybe even three that will follow the old school or some kind of hybrid approach. But at some point, this is just um, going to be over. Feature-wise um, on big data clusters. Big data clusters are three things. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about Azure Data Studio itself today or GitHub um, because most of you have probably seen Azure Data Studio before and most of you have probably been to GitHub before. We're still going to touch them briefly but many probably have not been exposed to big data clusters. So big data clusters is basically three things. It's data virtualization. It's a on-premise data lake. And that's one of the differentiations if you look at other tools and other solutions that keep coming up like um, Azure Synapse, for example. It comes with SQL Server, it comes with the box product. So it all comes on-prem. Of course, I can deploy that anywhere. I can deploy it to the cloud. I can deploy that in my private data center, which would now be called a private cloud because we don't have data centers anymore, I think. Um, or I could just deploy that on my local notebook if it has enough compute and memory capacity and everything, but it comes with the on-prem product. So if you're in an industry that is potentially heavily regulated, if you're just coming from a business that is traditionally still on-prem and is not planning to go or for whichever reason cannot move to the cloud anytime soon. This might be your solution to get um, into an integrated data lake that comes with Spark, that comes with Hadoop, with HDFS, and that also comes in with built-in AI and machine learning capabilities. And I'm just trying to gonna show you a couple of these over the course of the next, um, well, 20, 30, 45, um, whatever minutes, depending on how the discussion is going. What that means is, like I said, Big data clusters deploy on a platform called Kubernetes. I'm not going to go into detail also on what Kubernetes is, um, but I'm going to point out some resources to you um, on the next slide. Um, for the, so um, if you're, again, if you're from a DBA kind of role, definitely start looking in, into Kubernetes if you haven't yet. The idea of Kubernetes is basically you have lots of containers, so very small, lightweight 
mini virtual machines, which is completely wrong because a container is smaller and more lightweight than a virtual machine, but I still think it's a fair analogy. And the idea is in a big data cluster, you have all these bits and pieces and components, but you just deploy the whole thing as one. So it's not like, oh, there's 32 components. Now I have to run 32 different install routines. I have to install 32 different servers. No, technically it's kind of like 32 different servers or even more than that running in the background, but it's not like you're deploying all of them one by one manually, which is super important and which is part of the Kubernetes approach. So basically you just say, hey, dear Kubernetes master, I need one SQL master and I need a bit of my compute pool and my data pool. And, and the other interesting thing is from a connection point of view, you basically only talk to the SQL Server master, which is just a regular SQL Server 2019. So I got one endpoint and this endpoint will make sure that anything that's happening in the background or um, talking to the other pools will happen automatically. So I don't have to worry about that. These pools are basically, that's the magic sauce. This is where all these features that I've described um, in the previous slide basically sit. And it's the compute, the data, and the storage pool. The compute pool basically does nothing but scaling out compute capacity. So think of that. You're running a query, and that query accesses 10 different files. And I was saying, oh, what, what does he mean by files? We're going to get to that. So bear with me for a sec. I'm running eight different queries, and, and I'm running them at the same time. Instead of running them all on the master, I could have multiple SQL Server instances. And again, these would be full-grown SQL servers in my compute pool. And that's just for the sake of this example, say it's going to be eight um, instances in my compute pool. These eight instances, would that just run one query each? But it's not like you say, well, I want this query to run here and this query to run here. It will kind of decide that by itself and you basically just scale out your compute. Therefore, eight workers doing the work, this should be faster. Faster is kind of the whole idea of big data clusters in general. So the other thing that we have up here on the upper right, the SQL data pool, you see two SQL servers in there and that's two because the data pool does not make any sense with less than two SQL servers because the idea of the data pool is you have multiple SQL server instances and again, full grown SQL server instances. You have a big fact table, 100 million rows, 100 billion rows, whatever a big fact table is to you. Might also just be 10,000 rows, whatever a big table is to you. The idea of the data pool is you take that fact table and push it to the data pool. In my example, I got two SQL servers in there. This, SQL, this data will be split across these two SQL servers. That means instead of having one fact table with 10 million rows, I end up with two fact tables with 5 million rows each. Again, with the theory on being, well, if my table is only half as, half as big, it should probably be twice as fast. Well, this is not always how it works, obviously, but um, you get the idea. And if you see, oh, well, um, but I need this to be even faster. Well, then maybe add a couple of extra instances to your data pool. Don't make it with two nodes, make it with four nodes, make it with eight instances of your SQL server, and therefore just bring down the, the amount of data sitting in each SQL server. So it's not just like partitioning where you say, well, I'm splitting a table across multiple files, or I'm splitting a table across multiple subtables, if you want, so on the same SQL server. No, you're really splitting across multiple servers. Still from my end user perspective, this is exposed as one single table in the SQL Server master, and this is um, something that's never been there in this way. And then there is one more pool, the storage pool. And the storage pool, you can see the HDFS in there. It's basically a built-in file server. So you can take CSV files, you can take Parquet files, you can take, uh, and you can talk to that using Spark or SQL Server. And the cool thing about that is, first of all, multiple languages, either Spark or SQL. So in a traditional world, you would often end up with your data scientists using a completely different data storage than your SQL Server um, analytics users because they need it in a different way and they need to talk different languages to it and your backend doesn't support that. That's completely different here. And it comes with the built-in HDFS, so it really comes with the built-in file server. SQL Server becomes your file server. And in addition to that, down here, um, you see this, these small extra data sources. Microsoft also increased the capabilities of Polybase by a lot in SQL Server 2019. So now you can bring in data from other SQL servers, from Oracle, from Teradata, from DB2, from MongoDB, Cosmos DB, 
um, countless sources and bring them in as if they were local tables. So you could basically say, well, I'm running a query and in that query, I'm running, I'm selecting data that's sitting on my master. So just in a regular SQL table, as we've known it since mm -hmm. SQL Server, SQL Server 1, basically. I'm joining that against my fact table that I've distributed against my data pool. Then I got some, some lookup data that just sits here in some CSV file. And I'm even going to get some external data that sits in whichever kind of external data source. It could be a SharePoint list um, for that matter. So SQL Server kind of becomes your data hub for everything. Everything meaning data that sits in SQL Server in traditional tables, table data that just gets more performant data pool, but still sits in traditional SQL format. Data that is file-based, CSVs, Parquet files and stuff, but still sit now in SQL Server because the HDF is part of it. And even data that is not really physically located in your SQL Server. Pretty cool stuff. Again, if you want to learn more, learn more about Kubernetes, I got two recommendations for you. One of them is a book, which is the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. You can get it as a free ebook. The link is in there. Um, just download it, it's like 30 pages. You can also have that shipped to you for, I think, like three or four dollars. Um, and then you really get a nice um, children's book. And it explains the concept of Kubernetes um, as if you were a children. And if that book is not enough for you, um, reach out to this guy, Anthony Nocentino. Uh, he's got a ton of Pluralsight courses and he knows everything about Kubernetes that there is to know and a little bit more. So, again, Get acquainted with Kubernetes because this is the foundation of the future of deployment from my perspective. So what are we going to do with this today? We're going to use the storage pool, the master, and the data pool. But first, we're going to need some data. And we're going to get that from GitHub because that's another thing that many people underestimate, how much data there is available these days freely on GitHub, on Kaggle, on so many sources where you can just say, well, I want to run some analysis on that, but I kind of want to get the raw data and then just make something out of that. Obviously, also with always with the caveat that um, kind of need to double check where this data is coming from, who's been messing and mashing with that data. But let's leave that philosophical discussion for another day, maybe. What we will do is we get um, some population data. So basically just the number of inhabitants per country as a CSV file from GitHub. And we're also going to get the development of COVID cases from GitHub because John Hopkins University that I think everybody knows um, these days. Many people may not have been aware of that institution before, but I guess over the last couple of weeks and months, we all got to know all their fancy dashboards and stuff where they showed all the development. And we're just going to get that into our storage pool using Spark and Python. And one of the issues with the data that we get from John Hopkins, we're going to see that in a sec, is what they just do is every single day they add a column to their data set instead of adding rows. Yeah, exactly, Magnus. That's a nightmare. Um, or you just use one line of Python code. That just transpose it. Correct. Yeah, but uh, if you would be using traditional T-SQL, um, you would either do some very, 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 I'm going to say very for the next 20 minutes. Um, so you may edit that out of the recording. Um, some very unfancy unpivot or some very nasty dynamic SQL, because mm. that's, from my perspective, those would be the only ways of doing, without bringing in any, ex of course, I could bring in external tools that are able to do that, but... I mean, the beauty is doing all of that out of the box. And one of the things here, I got um, Python, everything built in. And Python has a one line of code that does just that. Um, awesome stuff. So, mm -hmm. And we're also going to be converting those CSV files into Parquet. Parquet, for those of you that are not aware um, of what it is, it's clustered column store for flat files. What this will do is, um, well, first of all, we're going to convert the white format into a long format, and then we're going to save it as Parquet from the CSV just because the Parquet is better organized, it's smaller, it's compressed, it's structured. So that means accessing it will be faster. Going to do some transformations and aggregations with that because what um, John Hopkins also does, they provide three files, the number of confirmed cases, the number of recovered cases, and the number of deaths. We want to join that together. So what I will do is I will just run a little query, join them, um, and push them to my data pool. Data pool is not exactly necessary for that amount of data because we're talking about 30,000 um, records, but um, it still gives you an idea. 
we're also adding a little mapping table to our data pool uh, to our master instance here and the reason for that is both the uh, data for, coming from john hopkins and the population data from github um, have a country column they don't always match they don't have like an iso code or anything so it's it's minor things so one says bahamas the other one says the bahamas um stuff like that um still something we need to be aware of and that we need to fix and since again this is about 150 rows we'll just push that into a local mapping table um, and be done and then we'll be running a query um population data 150 rows no need to do anything with that we're going to read live from the csv join that with our local mapping table join that against our data pool and then we can run all kinds of queries and analysis directly in azure data studio all using the same endpoint so it's demo time unless there's any questions before we get started no questions right now there i had go. one but i yeah it, it had more to do with kubernetes and clustering in multiple data centers uh, i'll ask uh, mr nosantino about it that's probably a smart decision because my answer would probably be to ask anthony about that yeah because my Kubernetes knowledge is limited to um, I know how to get it set up. I know how to break and delete a cluster. I know how to mess with it. So it does kind of the things that I needed to do. Um, um, but yeah, he, he's really the Kubernetes expert. I'm actually doing a pre-con with him on at past summit on, on modern database um, deployment. And yeah, big surprise. Um, he's covering the Kubernetes part. <laughs> Oh, I have one question now, which is please brief Parquet once again. OK, um, so the, the idea of Parquet is basically very simple. Um, you end up with a file that has the exact same data as your CSV, but it is structured and compressed. So it's a binary um, file. So um, it adds compression, so like zipping it, but it also um, adds some internal structuring to that. And that just makes it smaller and easier to um, access. But um, think of it like a compressed CSV file. Um, I like using the idea of cluster column store um, because that also kind of explains how much faster it can be. I've seen queries that ran 100 times faster just because I was converting the underlying data from CSV to Parquet. And converting a CSV file to a Parquet file is, again, two lines of code in Python um, that I can run directly in my big data cluster. And we're going to take a look at how that code looks like um, in one second, um, actually, here. I'm in Azure Data Studio. Um, like I said, I will not go into the details of Azure Data Studio today. Maybe um, I can come back for that one day. Just for those of you that are not using Azure Data Studio because you're not on Azure, please start using Azure Data Studio today because it is not just for Azure. It's just um, a horribly named product because Azure Data is just everything data related. So SQL Server is part of Azure Data. And the way this is communicated is not always as clear as I wish it would be. And it's not going to take your management studio away, but it has a couple of features um, that might be super interesting to you. Um, the first one might be the dark mode, and usually half of the room would be, oh, there's a dark mode, I'm sold. So that's one. If you don't care about the dark mode, um, like me, it also comes with, the, um, with an extensibility framework. So that means you can add extensions, and one of these extensions is, for example, an extension that comes directly from Microsoft that allows you to run a wizard to bring in external data. So I could run a wizard that helps me bring in data from other data sources to write the T-SQL and all that for it. Um, you know what, while we're at that, why not um, just do that here real quick. Um, you would just right mouse click and run that wizard. Um, yeah, I'll try not to get distracted, so I will not do it now. I might do it at the end. Um, one other thing is the implementation of so-called notebooks. You may have heard of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, the idea of a notebook is basically it's a nicely formatted markup document where you can mix code and documentation if you want. So it will also save the results. And Azure Data Studio has, unlike other um, tools, it has a SQL kernel. So I can actually run T-SQL in a notebook. And that it just means this notebook here will have a couple of different steps and I could um, add some nice documentation in between. So I could say, well, let's um, add some text cell in here. This does 
this and that. And I could format it. And as you can see, I could make this bold and I could add some headline. And if I would run this, it would give me the results just like a regular output window. But I could also take that notebook and save it with the results. So I could give you that notebook and it would give, you would see what the query result on my machine was, which is also super helpful. Again, if you're kind of building like a troubleshooting guide, for example. Um, we're not going to run this specific notebook. But um, all of the code that I'm showing and using today sits on GitHub. Um, so this is kind of the most important one. If you have a big data cluster and you want to use the demo, first thing you run this notebook and what it will do is it will create the database, will create all the schemas that um, the queries are using, will create all the file formats and everything. So um, if you want to try this out, just run this first notebook. I'm not going to do that now. So we're going to get rid of that. This is the first part I'm going to do. I run all here. And while this is happening, let's take a quick look first at where this data is coming from. So this is getting data from GitHub. And on GitHub, there's just um, a subset data sets. And one of the, those data sets is global population by year. Come on, GitHub, show me the data. There we go. It also has some subsets, so um, it groups a couple of Arabic countries into the Arab world and some European countries, and by some I mean some. Actually, the subsets are not super helpful. It even comes up with some arbitrary country codes, ARB, which is not a country, but they just made that up. Um, and starting in 1960 up to 2018, it just comes up with the value, and the value is the number of people living in that specific country or subset of countries. So what I'm doing here is I'm reading directly from GitHub, reading that data, dropping the country code column because, like I said, it's not helpful, only filtering on 2018. Then I'm also dropping the year because I only care about 2018 data. 2018 is just the last year that had data for every single country. And then I'm saving that as a CSV file directly to my HDFS. So if I go here, COVID CSV population. What we will see is two files with a rather unfancy name. If we preview that, you see, well, the country code is gone, the year is gone, but other than that, I got my country name and I got my value to that. It's all coming from there. And it's two files because my storage pool has two nodes. And those two nodes basically um, both should get something to work with. So what my Spark engine in the background automatically did, it split the file by the number of nodes. So both uh, when I'm querying that file, it's actually two nodes working on that same data. Again, two nodes sharing the work, that should be twice as fast. Do you define some kind of clustering key when you create the, the table in the storage pool? No. Data um, pool? So, so um, this would really be some kind of um, round robin thingy in the um, easy, you, you could do that. So mm -hmm. instead of just saying, okay, take all that CSV data and um, save it um, to the HDFS, you, you could give it all kinds of options. But in most cases, actually with the round robin, um, that's um, the best guess. Plus potentially I could obviously also start partitioning in here already and put it into um, different directories per year or something, which well, in this specific example, it doesn't really matter because we're ending up with about 150 rows or so. Then the even more important part. Oh, oh, hang on. Just need to restart my kernel here real quick. That's what happens if you let, there we go, your ADS timeout, come on. So while this is recovering, hopefully, the interesting yeah, part in the demos. <laughs> <laughs> um, take a look at this. This is the endpoint I'm connected to, my Ben BDC, and I'm talking Python to that. And this will be interesting. There we go. Um, in a second, when we start talking SQL to the very same endpoint, so it. Uh, if you're talking to the HDFS or if you're talking to the T-SQL part, if you're talking to the master or to the data pool or to the storage pool, you always connect to the same endpoint. So while this session is coming up, let's take a look at that data. 
This data is as of six hours ago. Like I said, um, they provide, we only care about the global data. Uh, they also provide US specific data, which will just be broken down by counties and so, but um, for what we're trying to do here, we don't really care about it. So like I said, what they do is they add columns every single day, which I will just act like you did, Magnus. No. Um, so they provide, uh, provide us um, the states where applicable. They give us a country um, or region. They give us the coordinates if you kind of want to visualize that on a map. And then what they do starting January 22nd, they just add a column for every single day. So I don't know how much longer they can do this because at some point um, many tools we get issues actually working with that. But um, I'm going to leave that up to them. And I hope they keep doing that for a while because um, in BDC or in Python and Spark, it's just one line of code, like I said. So what I'm doing here is pretty similar to what we had before. You know I need to do this in T-SQL just to, to test it. <laughs> yes, you can do that. And if you can do it in one single line of code, like I can do here, I'm going to buy you a beer. Well, I, I, it takes I you more than one line of code, you're buying me a beer. I guess that's, fa that's fair and it is now in the recording. <laughs> I think you'll get a beer. <laughs> Yay me. Unless um, you just do what I would do and cheat and just push it all into one line with a couple of semicolons. Just to prove the point that it could be done in one line of code. <laughs> I think anyway, I'm going to have to need some create function calls, so it's going to have to be its own batch anyway. So. Nice. So, um, again, I'm reading that file, and what I'm doing here, since it's three files, um, I kind of wrote a little function to just call that three times. Um, I'm dropping the coordinates because I don't care about visualizing it on a map. Um, and then I'm using that um, Python function that's called melt. And the melt function, basically what you will do is you say, these are the columns I want to keep. So this is basically my descriptive columns. Um, and this is what it's going to do with the rest of the columns. It will just take the, the headline of that column and put that into, um, into a row. And if we do that, this is what we end up with for the recovered and deaths and for the confirmed cases. So instead of having this row by, um, column by column, we end up with having that row by row. And that is obviously something that can be super easily consumed using T-SQL. And look, same endpoint, but now I'm talking SQL to the very same server. So connecting to the endpoint, First thing we do, we'll just run a little query here, select top 10. Okay, we get data up to yesterday because that's um, for what they've just updated. And I'm reading live from my parquet files. What I did is, um, and you will see that when you're trying to rebuild that demo, I pushed all my data in different schemas just to kind of visualize or make it clear in the query where the data is coming from. There's no need to do that. All that could sit in DBO, but this just shows you, okay, we're now reading from the storage pool from a parquet file. And I'm querying that, so I'm querying a file, a compressed file, as if it was a local SQL table. To me, that's already super cool. But there's more, there's more. Let's take that data, like I said, and um, join the confirmed cases against the recovered cases against the deaths and push that to our data pool. So basically, I'm just running a simple T-SQL query and push that to my data pool table here. 33,000 rows, I can do select count star from data pool DP COVID, um, so data pool COVID development. Again, this looks like a regular table, but in the background, when I'm running this query by connecting directly to the data pool, what this will do is it will run the same query against every single node in my data pool. What we see is physically speaking, these are two tables which are not exactly equally distributed, but almost. It's doing this batch-wise, so not record by record, because otherwise that insert would take forever. That would kind of be the same way like Dynamics handles data. Not great. So that's 16,500 rows here, 16,700 rows there. Uh, and again, this is not the typical amount of data where you would need to push that to the data cache. But um, and by the way, speaking of data cache, the data pool is not a primary way of storing data because it does not support transactions. So do not use this to just say, okay, this is where all my fact data lives and will be safe and sound there. 
because at some point one of your insert statements will fail and then you will need to do um, some kind of reload. So or make sure that you're really using it as a performance cache. That's it. And then let's say, hey, let's just run a little query by date and active cases um, for Germany ordered by date. Well, okay, this looks interesting, but since I'm in Azure Data Studio, I could even just visualize that real quick. So much nicer than I could do that in Management Studio. Well, doesn't look too bad. Well, if we say we only care about the last 30 days, things look slightly different again. So a little spiking again, now it's going down again. So, um, and of course you could do the configuration and stuff that it starts at zero. Um, same thing that we did with the parquet file, I can read my CSV file, top 10 from my CSV population. Again, this looks like querying a regular SQL table, but I'm querying a CSV, I'm querying a flat file. Like I said, some of them are not included um, in both. Like for example here, one says USA, one says US, um, one says Brunei, one says Brunei Jerusalem, um, and so on and so on. One says Taiwan with a star. For, for that purpose, I've just created a little mapping table, which is also part of that demo. So just to show you some of the differences here. And then I can go ahead and say, you know what? I would like to see as of the last date, so give me the last date that you find in the confirmed cases. So the last active value, please show me using that mapping table and that population, how many active cases did I actually have per million? Here we go, I guess America first. And this is the part where I said, let's try not to get too political. So um, we will not look um, I will just hide whatever the second country here is. And now some may say, well, okay, this is all very nice, but this is this is kind of almost data science-y. Well, I would argue about that, but um, data scientists don't use T-SQL. Well, fair enough. Then let's take the same data and just visualize that with Python. So, I'm just providing a little list here of the countries that I care about. You know what? Let's just add Sweden for that matter. And I'm doing nice and fancy data visualization again against the very same data set using Python or R or whatever tool for that purpose. Always connecting to the same endpoint, always using the very same data set. So that brings down the redundancy that I would have in data storage. And it would also make sure that everyone consuming that obviously gets the same result when asking the same questions. How cool is that? It's awesome. I'm trying to understand Python, but it looks like SQL to me. Uh, um, that is because so I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm, am I lazy? Is it just my German efficiency? I don't know. Um, I basically took the same query from the other side and just um, used the um, Python read SQL command. Yeah, sounds um, like a good idea. <laughs> but well, the thing is, um, what I mainly wanted to show here, um, again, also as part of the um, Azure Data Studio experience, what's just super cool is how you can bring those different languages together because, I mean, those out of the box visualizations, that's again just something T-SQL does not do. So all of these languages, um, they have their strengths and weaknesses. So just use what, and that, that's one of the other reasons why I was using SQL here. You do not need to be a Python expert to do this because basically what, what, I do, what was I doing here? Um, I copied, I, I said, I used a command that says read SQL. That took me like two minutes to Google. I copied and pasted my um, T-SQL command from the other end. And then I added one thing that's called plot. And then I Googled how I can actually change the headline by title equals. So you do not need to be an expert in Python um, to do this. And I don't consider myself even close to being an expert in Python. Um, 
I know less about Python than I know about Kubernetes, and that's already very, very little. So having that said, you just need to know Google. That's good. Uh, exactly. <laughs> that's how I learned Melt. <laughs> um, are there any questions? And while you're thinking about questions or while you're looking at questions, um, there's three links in here that might be helpful for you. If you if you get a Pluralsight subscription, um, please do check out the course, bookmark.ws slash BDC course. Bookmark.ws BDC book would lead you to the book. And the demo code and also the slides for today would be at bookmark.ws slash BDC code. Good. That was one of the questions. Is Will there be a link to the, uh, I guess this leads to GitHub. So I will just take that link and post it on the session page on sqlfriday.net along with the video. So yeah, I just figured that um, if you're doing GitHub git deep links, they just go um, get slash tree slash code slash master slash something. So um, they just cry to um, get some typos in there. So I figured I will start making those nice mm -hmm. and fancy short links here. One question, could you explain the license price for BDC or is it complicated? It's if SQL, so of course it's complicated. Or? It's not complicated, it's just expensive. No. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, BDC is part of standard edition and enterprise edition. So if you have a standard edition of SQL Server, you can use BDC. Um, the only thing that um, will be different or that it will determine is the number of extra nodes you can use. So, um, and that is something I would need to look it up. Um, but if you go to the licensing guide, it's in there. Um, I think it's one by one for standard edition and one by eight for um, enterprise edition. That means for any node, for any core that you license on your um, master instance, you would get extra um, eight extra um, cores for the um, additional nodes, basically. Okay. Yeah, I guess not every company is going to use BDC. Uh, and there is always some licensed guy or contact to talk to. Maybe it's a good idea to, to do that. No, but there, so in the, in the license guide, um, it's, ve it's very well explained. Um, so they got all these illustrations in there. So this is what you get. This is what you don't get. And if you would need additional extra cores um, on the um, pool side, you could also separately buy them. So you would not need to buy extra cores for the master node. The big question is more, how many um, cores do I need? And this is where pretty much everyone at this point is, is still lacking experience because this is a brand new product. It just went live end of last year. Mm. Um, we're just about seeing the first implementations actually going into production. So it's not like, um, hey, I'm building a data warehouse. What do you think? Um, how much storage or how much CPU or how much ever I need? And you would have um, hundreds of consultants saying, well, in my experience, you do this and this and this because just nobody has a ton of real life experience on this. Mm -hmm. But how many, you said, I mean, what's the usage of it so far? Um, it's pretty hard to tell, honestly. Um, so I'm talking to a couple of customers that are in POC stages and so. Mm -hmm. uh, I also know a couple of customers that are already, already in production. Most, so the typical BDC customer is coming from a highly regulated, um, highly secure environment because that, that is one of the reasons these days why you would go. So financial institutions, banks, insurances, um, mm -hmm all kinds of um, other sectors like this, or potentially people that cannot go to the cloud because um, of where they're located. So I could also think of something like an oil rig or something maybe. But yeah. these are usually highly regulated also in a way that they don't talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it. So True. you would rarely see people from a bank come up, hey, let me show you exactly how our infrastructure looks like. Um, mm. So. Uh, if you go to the official Microsoft customer portal and look for BDC references, I think there's like two or three. Mm. Um, I know there's way more than that, but um, I could not tell you, is it like 500 companies? If it is it 5,000? Is it 50,000 that are actually evaluating it? Um, because most people don't 
openly talk about that. Mm. I get it. I know for a fact that every single of my BDC customers um, made it pretty clear to me that I could not mention who they are. So, ah, okay. So they are. Let me let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Just include it in the repo, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they said I couldn't say it. They said I could not dance it. <laughs> cool. And the book uh, is good. I haven't Thank finished you. it. Uh, I am trying to understand while I read it, so it's going to take me a while. I'm slow. Uh, yeah, but, and also uh, feel free to skip the chapters that Enrico wrote. They're not that good, you know. <laughs> hey, Enrico. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Does it? I don't remember. Does it say in the book no. who wrote the chapter? No, no, we, no, we don't say it. Okay, so you'll have to give me a reference then. <laughs> So I know which you page can make is a guess. You, you tell me which chapters you liked, and then I will tell you if we're still friends. Ah, no, I don't dare to do that. <laughs> okay, they were all very good. <laughs> uh, could no, be because, well, honestly, we figured, first of all, it wouldn't matter who wrote it. And also, there were a couple of chapters where we both wrote, um, even up to the point that we wrote individual paragraphs. So um, how would you? There's just two authors. I think it doesn't really matter. Okay. Jan Lundström is saying that he recommends the Plural Site course. So Thank I, you. I, I might say the same. I just need to take the course first. And the course is actually it's like like 50 minutes or so. It's so it's it's not a typical super long Plural Site course. So the idea is oh. really just um to give you an idea on um, how you can get started, how you can deploy it. So mm -hmm. um it's an easy to watch one. Well, easy for me but, to say since I since I made the course but um but can you install it on a, a Kubernetes cluster service in Azure so you don't need yes. the infrastructure yourself for it just Correct. to play with it you can deploy yeah. it to um cube ADM to Hyper-V uh, to um, VMware you can deploy it to AKS and um there's actually one one video part in there that is like four minutes or so um that will show you how you deploy to AKS cool so, um, of course, still watch the full thing because um, I need the royalties, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't know many people getting rich from Pluralsight, but I hope you get something. Writing books about SQL is usually not what buys you a house either. Um, well, um, I couldn't comment on the Pluralsight part yet, but then again, um, I, I mainly did it um, out of the fact that you to no travel going on for the past and upcoming weeks and months, I was like, well, I got all that time that I will usually spend on planes, so let's do something meaningful with that. And it was a super interesting experience. I'm actually working on my second Pluralsight course now, um, mm. which will be completely different. So um, this one was a course where you don't get to see me at all. My next mm. course will be a, um, they call it a live course. So you basically get to see me for the whole course. Oh. So almost no slides. Um, so just for the experience, I have to say, it, um, this is worth it for me. And then, um, yeah, I have no idea yet how the whole payment thingy will work or not. No. But about the um, the notebooks, there is no Visual Basics for kernel for it, no? <sighs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> I keep I bringing it up with the product group whenever I get the chance, and they're always like, yeah, we don't see the use case, we don't see the need, but I, I think they're just missing the big picture there. Yeah, yeah. So, Microsoft, if you're listening, Magnus also asked for the VB kernel. <laughs> now, now we're two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can do VB.NET in the .NET kernel. Um, in .NET Core? Uh, I don't think you can. I th well, in theory, you probably could, but I think they're only exposing the um, C sharp and F sharp um, endpoints to that. I think that's an insult. They they expose the F sharp, but not VB. That's I don't know. Yeah, but but I, I don't think they really expose F sharp because nobody's using that. So I mean, they probably just say, well, it's there, but nobody really. Jon is a premier field engineer. He, he promises to tell the product team. So yeah, I, well, that's good. Yeah, Jan, also make sure to let them know that you want that because if, if you bring up my name, <laughs> then they might be like, yeah, no, we had that discussion before. 
there may or may not have been beers involved and it may or may not have changed anything. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm going to take over presentation for a little yeah. while. Uh, if I find it, I need to start my presentation first. And come on, how do I do this? Teams is not my main thing. There we go. I just wanted to show everyone that we have more sessions coming to SQL Friday. Uh, like next week, Joseph Richberg is gonna teach us about building a complete API in Azure. And it's of course an API for databases, um, Azure SQL database. And then I'm kind of excited because I never saw Menaka Basker Pillai, I hope that's the right pronunciation, uh, present before. Uh, I never heard her name before she uh, she posted a session to, to SQL Friday. And then I looked her up and she's mainly a .NET developer, but this one is gonna be about Cosmos DB. So that's kind of new stuff to me as well. But uh, I think we have a, a nice schedule coming up for the, what is it, up to number 16. I think number 17 is also posted on the uh, on the schedule page on uh, sqlfriday.net. Maybe so, one addition to that. Um, if you do not know what to do on the 14th of August before and after the SQL Friday session. 14th of August, um, we're going to have new stars of data. So if you go to newstarsofdata.com, shameless self plug. Um, no, but it's a good one. You it's, can register for the event and it will be running in the morning and afternoon from a European perspective. So we're not going to clash with SQL Friday. Otherwise, I would not have dared to say anything. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing about new stars of data is we will only have newcomer speakers. So brilliant people mm -hmm. with so much knowledge, but they have never presented at another conference before. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, um, we would be happy if a couple of you would join us there um, because we got some awesome sessions. The schedule is posted. So if you go to newstarsofdata.com, you will um, see the schedule and that's also where you can sign up. It's free to attend. Um, and obviously you do not, so we're gonna have three tracks with seven sessions each, so 21 sessions total, uh, and you can join us for the full day or just parts of it. We will have a long break over lunch of I think almost three hours mm -hmm. um, due to time zones because we're starting with New Zealand early in the morning and then we're ending with the West Coast in the evening and we figured, well, at some point people will need and want to step away from their computer for a bit, including us. So that's why we're doing that extended break. So um, yeah, check out the schedule. And if there's something that interests you, um, just sign up. Like I said, it's free and join us there. And then over lunch break, um, you will have more than enough time to get a proper lunch and listen to Torsten. Perfect. And uh, on September 11th, Nick, Kola Illich is going to present on SQL Friday and he's also presenting on uh, new stars of data. So Correct. He's, he's doing his first ever on that one. I think it's kind of brave to do a virtual conference the first time you do a presentation because it's well, uh, different than other virtual conferences. We even sent our speaker speaker shirts. Oh, that's cool. We, we only sent stickers on Data Weekender. No, Did so you get one, by the way? I did not get one. Now okay. that you mention it. Then you'll have to just email me your postal address and I'll send it to you. I have a couple of ones I will do that. to spare. No, no. So I, I just thought, um, you know what, this is their first ever conference. And um at some point, um I usually don't even I usually don't even take speaker shirts anymore for most events unless it's something that was like, well, I never spoke there and this is um super cool. Mm -hmm. um, but this is their first conference, um, and I will always remember the first um event that I spoke at. And Which was well, it? Uh, SQL Saturday Vienna. Oh, right. That's, it's an awesome event. So. It, it's an awesome event. Um, and that was the first time I ever got um, the chance to speak. And I still have that um, dark green um, speaker shirt from that event because um, this reminds me of this. Um, so I figured, well, our speakers will need to have um, speaker shirts, which is a logistical nightmare in these days. 
like for example new, Ze new zealand is currently not not accepting um any parcels oh. so um, we're currently trying to set, uh, figure out if we can kind of send it as a letter without anybody noticing uh, how great <laughs> this ends up in the recording um, <laughs> German customs, if you're listening. I was kidding. Um, of course, of course. And also New Zealand customs. I mean, but New Zealand and Australia, they're not that picky about getting things sent, right? Yeah. <laughs> Never been. How would they care? No, um, but... Um, as, and I'm super excited, by the way, about our speaker from New Zealand, um, because she's also our youngest speaker. I think she's 13, 13 or 14. Um, so this will also be... An amazing session. Super looking forward to that. What's so, the topic yeah. of that one? Yes. Um, <laughs> you entertain sorry. the crowds while uh, while I'm doing some kind of distraction here. I should have been prepared for that session, of course. Um, her, the exit. So I, I briefly knew it, but so her session is my data journey from a kid to teenager. Cool. Um, and she will kind of talk about um, her SQL skills, Power BI skills, um, development development of games and stuff. Um, and she's 13. And um, well, she's been doing that since she was nine. So I'm super looking forward to that. I'm, I started programming when I was 12. I don't think I knew what a database was before I started probably high school or yeah. by the end of it. Some paradox. My first language was, of course, basic uh, on a Commodore 64. So. But Not even Visual it, Basic. No, it didn't exist back then, I think. <laughs> <laughs> if you, the background noises you hear, it used to be my kids fighting. Now it was the eight year old coming up to the 12 year old saying, I'm sorry without me forcing him to do it. And that's the first time it's ever happened. So it almost You're makes me this cry. Is, this is my good influence. So. I think it is, yeah. <laughs> so maybe you could come here and help me parent the kids. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> See, this would make so many things so much easier because that means you would not have to send me any stickers because I could just pick them up. This is also how I could just get that beer that you owe me for not getting all those all that code into one single line. So. Um, True, true. But I haven't tested it yet. I think I no, I won't get it on one line, yeah. even even if I would make it dynamic SQL, and I, it still wouldn't be a one liner. So. Plus, Germany has just decided that Sweden is safe for us to travel again. So um, they I, did. Yes, okay. uh, I think yesterday or so. All of Sweden or just some regions? Um, I'm saying all of Sweden without. Uh, I, I just briefly check on um, the changes in the morning. So there might be a couple of exceptions to that, but. I think from Norway, you can only travel to four or five counties in Sweden. So. Yeah. But SQL Saturday Oslo is going to be virtual anyway, so I'm good. Swedes can also go to Germany, John says. Okay. But who wants to go to Germany anyway? <laughs> What's happening? Where is the digression coming from? See, you, Jan, you're always uh, welcome um, to come to Germany. And if you ever come to the southern part of Germany, um, let me know. Uh, and I'm happy to buy your beer as well. For, I mean, that's the best uh, best beer in the world. There we go. Yeah, um, true. Corin Verberg, if you're listening, um, <laughs> eat that with your Belgian beer. <laughs> Okay, let's not make this a flame war about <laughs> Or let's make it a flame war about bear. Well, I don't get it. Why not? Schlapp a seppel. I don't know. I That's not. kind of hard to say after five beers, I think. I will need to Google what that even is. Okay. It's apparently the best bear in the world. Okay. Schlapp a seppel. Okay. Um, I think that's... um. Famous last words. <laughs> yeah, probably will be. So, um, <laughs> thanks all very much um, for your attention and for joining. Thank you, Magnus, for having me. Thank you for coming. That was, was fantastic. Awesome. And um, yeah, looking forward to hang out virtually or in person again um, whenever we get the chance. Yeah. Um, you all have a great weekend. And again, if there's any questions afterwards or so, um, please feel free to reach out. My um, Twitter handle and email address are also in the slides of bookmark.ws slash bdc code. And with that, 
have a great weekend. Thanks, Perfect. everyone. Perfect. See you. Bye. Bye.